Astronomy Cast, episode 307 for Monday, May 20th, 2013, The Pacific Ring of Fire. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing well. So this is our kind of last reminder to people, although I guess it's, when people get it in the feed, it's going to be too late. Yeah. We will have already can done it. Go back and look go at everything on YouTube. Yeah, go back and if you yeah, go back and look at all of the mad twenty four hour uh, Cosmo Quest uh, a thon. Yes. What's the official name of this? Hang out a thon. Hang out a thon. There yes. you go. Um, yeah, where we I guess at this point did more than twenty four hours of space hanging out. Well, not we, mostly you. And, yeah, and other and Nicole. noisy astronomer. Yeah, yeah. and I only you know I only jumped in at occasional moments after being well rested and helped to entertain. That's so. okay. You have children. You are never well rested. <laughs> That's true too. Um, yeah, and so it starts on June fifteenth and sixteenth. And what's the exact time that it starts? We are starting at noon Eastern, nine Pacific, uh, U.S. time zones, and going through until 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on Sunday. So we're going from Saturday morning to Sunday evening. Uh, we're going to do a virtual star party on Saturday. We have Scott Sigler coming in to talk with Seth Shostak about the trope of aliens existing everywhere on human habitable worlds. We have uh, Amy Roth coming on to talk about making space jewelry. We have the band um, The Jungle Fire, which does uh, secular soul music, and I just love that concept. Concept um, and so many others too numerous to yep. discuss here. All of this is going on YouTube on the Astrosphere Vids channel. Okay, um, so go check it out. All right, and yeah, so check out the Cosmic Quest page. I'm sure there's going to be more information there. Yeah, awesome. Okay, let's uh, let's go. So the Pacific Rim of Fire wraps around the Pacific Ocean, including countries like Japan, Canada, New Zealand, and Chile. And the inhabitants within those countries are prone to oh, killer earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis. So let's chat about the history of this region and the kinds of risks they face. Now, now, Pamela, we always talk about how you live in the danger zone. For tornadoes, yes. adorable, horrible tornadoes. Yes, that can uh, yeah. That was, as we've seen recently, there was you know terrible tragedy in Oklahoma. Yeah, so, Oklahoma was so horrible. these are absolutely a, a um, you know a big risk to humanity uh, for the people living there. And yet, sort of on the same side, folks like me living on the uh, west coast of Canada live in the Pacific Ring of Fire, and that's where I've got tornadoes. Sorry, I've got volcanoes. <laughs> I've got earthquakes. I've got uh, tsunamis, yeah, and as we've seen recently, you know, the folks in New Zealand, the folks in Chile, the folks in Indonesia. There's a lot of really dangerous sort of stuff going on here. Yeah, we have the rare extreme earthquake here because we yeah. have the San Madre Fault, which no one quite understands. It's like in the middle of a plate being confused. Um, but the folks along the coast of North and South America on on the western side. Um, and then the folks all along the, the bands of island nations, so Indonesia, uh, Philippines, um, all the way up then through Japan, across, across the Aleutian Islands, uh, off of Siberia and Alaska, depending on which end you start. Um, all of these people have the misfortune of being on the edge of the Pacific plate. And this is a plate that is moving in unfortunate directions. It is um, pulling away from the Nazca line, um, which, which is a plate that's rubbing up against South America. Um, and as it pulls away from the Nazca plate, it is bashing itself wholeheartedly into the plate that Japan rests on, that Australia rests on. And at these points of collision, it's it, the plates are, are colliding. And you're ending up with welling up of um, magma, so you end up with, with lots of volcanoes in Japan. Mount Fuji is perhaps the most um, notorious example, although it doesn't do too much damage nowadays. Um, but there's lots of active volcanoes there. You also have all sorts of active volcanoes all throughout the Indonesian islands and the Philippines. Uh, Krakatoa is a famous example. Um, and this is again caused by the upwelling of magma. And as the plates collide, um, 
it, it's one of those things where it's like trying to move something along asphalt. It moves and then it'll get stuck with friction on the asphalt. You have to give it a good solid push to overcome that getting stuck, that friction. Well, when a giant continental plate becomes unstuck, it can have traumatic consequences as was seen in Japan two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so so let's kind of go into that then. So so when you say that these plates can get stuck, mm -hmm. you know what is it? What does it that mean exactly? So so you have two different processes, uh, three different processes really going on when you have a collision taking place. You can have subduction, which is where one plate goes under and the other plate goes over. And just like if you're trying to slide one piece of paper underneath another piece of paper, as you do that, you might end up with the one plate buckling instead of just politely sliding underneath due to functional a, forces. A quick note for the uh, for the audio listeners, Pamela's making some really awesome hand gestures here to, <laughs> to show this, so, you know, if you ever want, we always record these episodes live on Google+, Plus, and if you want to see Pamela's thrilling hand gestures, I, I highly recommend you watch it. Every Monday at noon Pacific, uh, <laughs> 3 Eastern, uh, you can watch Pamela make hand gestures to go along with her astronomy. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, anyways, speaking... Right. Non actual sign language at the camera. Um, so, so as, as the one tries to go under, friction might cause it to get stuck and it buckles up at the edge. Um, that, that buckling up is, is one thing, but then as it gets stuck, well, eventually all of that force building up behind it is going to give way to that plate moving. And it can sometimes move a few meters at a time. And when you're talking about a continent moving a few meters in a few minutes, that's a whole lot of energy that gets released. And it gets released in the form of sound waves. It gets released in the form of kinetic energy with the motion. And you can get everything from sharp jolting motions to a slow rolling rumbling motion. Um, but either way, it's motion of things that has buildings and people or water on top of it. And so I remember in the case of Japan, I mean, there was an earthquake and it was very bad. <laughs> But the even worse part was this terrible tsunami that followed right. moments so, so after. The, the release of the energy into, wa into the water was what caused this terrific standing wave to start radiating away from the point of the epicenter of the earthquake. So the, the earthquake appear, uh, appeared to have occurred uh, ways off the coast of Japan underneath the seafloor. And... People are working to try and understand how do you predict which seafloor earthquakes are going to generate tsunamis and which aren't. And what they're finding is you can look at the energy that's released in the form of sound and measure that using horns dropped into the water to listen. And um, ones that produce tsunamis release vast amounts of sound wave energy. And um, that can be used to predict just how tall the tsunami heading towards land might be. So you have the energy released during, so it's all the potential energy, basically spring energy of the two plates trying to collide, getting released during the release of that essentially spring energy. Um, some of the energy gets converted into sound energy and that sound energy predicts just how big the standing wave that is carrying the water with all the energy trapped in it towards land might be. One of the problems in Japan is their predictions for how tall the tsunami would be. It was predicted to be much shorter than it actually was, so people didn't seek high enough ground. And I think, you know, if you watch the videos of the tsunami coming in, I think, you know, uh, it, people kind of, you know, imagine this tsunami as this great big breaking wave that, that comes in and crashes in, but it really was this, was this, Upswell, like it just the water level just got deeper and deeper and deeper, and it just overflowed the banks, and then you know, and and material from the ocean was sort of being pushed inland, and you know, cars were being inundated, and then buildings were being inundated. Like it's just this this fast, relentless rise in water. It's it's quite it's quite terrifying, and and I you can yeah. see how you know once you realize that you were in the middle of this, you wouldn't see this wave off of the distance, you know, coming towards you, and you flee to higher ground. It's just this rise in water all around you. Really and scary. The the best demonstration you can do to try and wrap your head around what's going on with a tsunami is uh, next time you change your sheets when you go to put the flat sheet on. Um, I'm assuming you're not using a duvet, being a Westerner here. Um, 
grab the edge of that flat top sheet and just fluff it up with one quick jerk on the edge and you'll have this wave that propagates through the sheet and when it does this the other side of the sheet has to come towards you in order for that wave to get formed out of something well in this case the tsunami is instead of having someone's hands yank the edge of the sheet to put in the the wave it's the energy of the earthquake is that initial point for the formation of the wave but the water that goes into this tsunami has to get drawn from somewhere so when a tsunami is about to take place all the water goes out from the shore and suddenly you end up with significantly more beach than you would even during the lowest of low tides and that's one of the early warning signs and don't then it, go out and pick oysters no. run yeah <laughs> right? and and so when you see the water going out go up go up go up go up yeah. and unfortunately while they did get very early warning that a tsunami was coming they didn't yet understand the role that measuring the sound had in predicting the height. They underestimated the height, and drowning was the leading cause of death. And it was just because people didn't get high enough. But even, but even so, I mean, that is a that is a well organized country, a well organized response to the tsunami. I mean, the loss of life it could have been so much could have been so much worse. And we've seen so much worse in recent memory. We saw what happened Haiti. in in Indonesia. We saw what happened in Haiti. Exactly. Yeah. And and so I think, you know, I live in a, you know, I live on the Pacific Ring of Fire. I live on Vancouver Island. And, you know, this is a, this is actually, you know, like, as you are well aware and made aware of the risks of, um, uh, of tornadoes where you live, yeah, we've got something very similar for earthquakes and tsunamis and stuff where, where I live. So, for example, you know, our buildings are all done in a very special kind of code, you know, that all of our, yeah. that, you know, all of our houses have to be done in the special wood frame. If they're larger than that, you know, they have to be done with steel and sort of in, in certain Floating ways. Floating levels. Yeah, exactly. And in, in Vancouver, there's a great building that, that actually has a, like a pillar in the middle and the whole building actually floats on these these um, cables that hang from this from this pillar, and so the whole building can rock back and forth in an earthquake. Um, you know, the children are all trained and go through earthquake drills. I remember that I grew up in drills. Southern California, and we we had that in Southern California as well. Yeah, and so they'll do that just like you'll do fire drills. Our kids will do earthquake drills. Yeah, and we do when, tornado drills. And when you're out on the west coast, when you actually go out to the coast, there they mark out every spot which is at tsunami risk. So you'd be driving mm -hmm. along, and then a sign will say you're now entering a tsunami zone, and there are wow. um, there's sirens on all of the you know on poles and trees in the area so that if you hear the sirens go off you know and there's defined routes to get to higher ground in every one of these tsunami zones and in fact if you drive down the west coast of the United States it's the same thing you're like now I'm in a tsunami zone now I now I'm out so um so then I think you know how does the the, the ring of fire manifest itself in different ways because you know you mentioned that you've got the situation where the plates are coming together over in Japan but it, but here I know they're they're rubbing There's, yeah so going sideways it, right it, it depends on which plate is involved and and so along the Aleutian Islands along the coast of Japan you have plates that are mushing together uh, then you have the Philippine plate and they're still trying to figure out which direction it's going that one it it's been harder to tell. Uh, we're colliding with the Australian plate. There's this rogue plate, the Nazca plate, that is between South America and the Pacific plate. And um, it's, it's another one where it's colliding with the South American plate. That's part of what's creating the Andes Mountains. Um, but then uh, along the coast of where you are, there's, again, this extra floating plate, the San de Fuca I don't know if I said that right, a uh, San de Fuca plate. And, and it's one that's kind of caught in the middle between the North American plate and the Pacific plate. And those two plates are moving in different directions, which is where California runs into all of its problems. That, that's those two plates colliding together. And, and there's points of weakness. Uh, so the San Andreas Fault can be viewed as a point of re weakness where these two plates are rubbing against each other and the, la the land is fracturing underneath. Yeah, and I know that for us, um, it runs a couple of hundred kilometers off the coast of Vancouver mm -hmm. Island, which I guess is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, yeah, which that's, is... that's actually the San de Fuca plate there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's uh, Fu San de Fuca? Fuca. 
Um, okay. Uh, but, uh, right, and so you get the situation where, and we actually did have an earthquake, a very strong one, just north of here, just well, south of a, an area called Haida Gwaii, sort of the uh, Queen Charlotte Islands. And it was very powerful, but it was far enough away that, that I didn't feel it. But it was like, I think it was like 8, magnitude 8. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's quite... Uh, Quite enormous. So, what causes this plate, and what causes this whole region to have well, this? I mean, you talk about this this yeah. plate, but why do we have one big plate like this? Why isn't it smaller? Why isn't it, it bigger? Well, so some of these things we can't easily answer. Uh, the best way to try and understand this is if you've ever tried to cook something that convex instead of boils. So, oil convex, where you get this. Um, cells of hot oil rise and cells of cold oil sink um, but you don't end up with the bursting bubbles you don't have gas manifesting itself in oil you just end up with this churning um, you can if you get your cherry filling just right cherry filling will convect now if you have a semi-solid floating on top of this convective surface that motion underneath that churning underneath can lead to a fracturing of the semi-solid surface in this case, we have a planet that is molten and convective in, in the layer beneath the crust. And our crust, just like that semi-solid surface on top of your convecting food, um, it ends up fragmenting. And those fragments get moved around by um, the, in this case, it's the combined inside the planet, it, everything's rotating, and so you end up with a certain amount of differential rotation. It's not a big deal with the Earth, um, but it does act to add to the motion. Um, one of the things that I've seen questions raised about is part of the reason that Venus doesn't have plate tectonics the way we do, simply because it's not rotating sufficiently fast. Does that play a role? No one knows yet. We're still figuring these things out. Um, but when we look at the biggest plates, there are actually arguments about are we dividing the plates up enough? Can we divide them down farther? What really defines a plate? Because we do have fault lines. Like I live, as I said, near the San, San Madreas fault line, um, San Madre fault line, rather. And um, I live right in the middle of the North American plate. But does that mean that really the North American plate is several smaller plates or does it mean the plate I'm on is cracked and some of the pieces just move a little bit more readily than other pieces? This starts to get into fine-grained arguments of taxonomy. But overall, um, you have these large plates that the continents rest on that are moving apart. So. Uh, for instance, uh, right through the center of Iceland, which has a stripe of fire, you might say. That's where the two plates are pulling apart. Iceland's getting gradually larger and larger and larger as the plates pull apart. Volcanoes are all over Iceland, but the ring of fire is pretty much entirely where plates are colliding together. Um, you have a mid-ocean trench with the Nazca plate and the Pacific plate. And as the plates collide together, you end up with around the entire Pacific Rim, volcanoes and earthquakes. Now, the one confusing point is Hawaii. Hawaii is just this random set of hot spots people are still trying to figure out that sits smack in the middle of a plate. Um, so Hawaii is not really part of the Ring of Fire. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's like a hot spot that could appear almost anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, although it is kind of bit right in the middle of the Ring of Fire. Coincidence? Um, well, yes. I, I can't know. I, I can't speak to that. I mean, there, there's everything from people who think that the Hawaiian Islands are actually um, where something broke through the crust and left a weak point. And as um, this, the surface crust moves, there's a weakened hot space. There, there's all sorts of things that don't entirely make sense that get put together to try and explain Hawaii. What we know for certain is as the plate moves, it's ex exposing new parts of crust to the hot spot underneath. And so you end up with a chain of islands as the crustal plate moves, exposing right. more to the hot spot. And, and again, I think, you know, you know, back to like, say, the, the United States, have you ever done like I-5? Have you ever driven I-5 yeah. from, yeah. from Canada down to California? I've and, done LA to San Francisco, far less exciting, but yeah. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> well, right. But, but if you do that, that, there is constantly, there is a 
pretty much a, a volcano in sight for huge chunks of that drive. As you're driving south, there's Mount Baker, and then there's Mount Rainier, and then there's Mount Hood, and then there's Adams, and you know, and Mount Shasta, which is gigantic, and you see it for yeah. hours and hours and hours. So you can really see that you've got these these volcanoes just up and down the coast, and there's a you know there's some in the some stuff in Canada, not a lot, but then as you go down to like places like Costa Rica, you know there's some amazing volcanoes. Now now why do we get like if you're in Costa Rica for example, there's there's ones that are in a constant state of eruption, ones that are like blobbing out lava, nonstop. But in places like in the United States, you get places like Mount St. Helens, right, which build up for um, a long time and then detonate. So why do you get that difference, even though it's sort of all the same plate? Well. It's it's different chemistries and different types of volcanoes is one part. It's different geometries to the different volcanoes is a different role. Um, the rate of magma production plays a role into this. So if you have one that uh, hasn't, it, it's more active in creating the magma, or or rather, there's a larger channel that allows the magma in. It's going to grow much more quickly. So there was a case in Mexico. I believe in the 50s of a farmer's field that got a hot spot that a few years later was a giant volcano and then it pretty much stopped. Right. Yeah, um, I remember that story. It was like a yeah. We had that as like a a book, like it was a it was a kids book. I remember yeah, reading you and I this. Yeah, talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. And and I always wanted the farmer's field behind our house to grow a volcano. Me too. Um, I was that would have been so small cool. Child. Yeah, yeah, but it would have ruined our house. Oh, um, but it but I was awesome. a child. Yeah. Yes, it would have been awesome. Yeah. Um, so, so all around the Ring of Fire, it's, it's a matter of how the plates are colliding. What's kind of neat is you, you don't always, when you have the plates colliding, end up with Ringo volcanoes. So where you look at the India plate hitting the Euro-Asia plate, you have the Himalayan mountains, and Mount Everest is not a volcano. It's just a giant, insert expletives, mountain. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, you have two plates coming together and ridging upwards. And it's where they come together and ridge upwards. You don't get the same volcanism, um, but you do get giant mountains. And, and kudos to the giant mountains. So, so now, living here on, <laughs> on the, in the Ring of Fire, <laughs> yes. uh, you know... I think we don't get the same kind of constant in your face fear of it. I think that that you do, for example, with the tornadoes. Like you experience a certain amount of tornado fear, and rightly so. I mean, you know what happened a couple of weeks ago with yeah. you having a tornado pass right through. I mean, the, you know, we get occasional earthquakes. How how dangerous is this for me to live here? It's one of those types of statistics that is hard for a human to wrap their brain around. So, for instance, when you look at one in however many thousand people will die by airplane, that doesn't mean that each individual has that kind of probability. You need to instead look at how many 747s fall out of the sky, and the probability comes from the fact that a 747 carries a shed load of people on it. Um, one tornado generally won't kill a lot of people, one earthquake will kill a lot of people. So what you need to consider isn't what is the probability of an individual getting killed by an earthquake, but what is the probability of where I am getting violently shaken by an earthquake. And places where you are, it, it looks like it's probably a every hundred years to every couple hundred years, there's a devastating earthquake. But we're still trying to understand those things better. Um, some plates are move plates are moving more than others. That's why China keeps having so many issues. Yeah, I know, and I know that there are some there are some examples of some pretty bad. You know, as you look at the archaeologists, as they look back in time and look at these you know different sites. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's we had a situation a couple of hundred years ago. Um, you know, we had uh, pyroclastic flows, which you know wiped out uh, villages. Yeah. You know, of the I think it was of the the Niska tribe in my area. Yeah, uh, and in, in our area, we did see the city of St. Louis when it was first getting founded got completely flattened by an earthquake that actually changed the flow of the Mississippi River. Yeah. So so it's yeah. when you consider that the largest river in the United States had its path changed, moved, and temporarily reversed direction because of an earthquake that. 
gives you a sense of how much power they can have. Big and chunks of, of, of uh, Seattle are built on the pyrocastic flows from Mount Rainier. And, and when you start thinking that Mount Rainier isn't dormant, it's no. simply paused. Mm -hmm. And we don't know when it will unpause, and there's a huge population around it. Um, that's a little bit unsettling, to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you ever want to have a very fast, comparatively, view of vast numbers of volcanoes and you have lots of money to burn or vacation, um, the flight from Beijing to Seattle goes um, up and over the Aleutian Islands and back down along um, the, the coast of Canada. And I remember waking up at one point on that flight and then couldn't stop looking out the window because it was snow-capped volcano after snow-capped volcano. Right. And you can occasionally see some of the elastic Alaskan ones smoking out in the distance. And right, you've amazing. got all those ones up the coast of, of Russia. Yeah. You know, and then, and then all the ones along the Aleutian Islands. And then, yeah, that would just be amazing. Yeah, yeah, so that that's one way to get a great view of them is is to take that morning flight out of Beijing and land in the afternoon in Seattle. <laughs> right now, now, what impact did sort of the the large movement of the continents have on the Ring of Fire? Like, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, we had Pangaea, and I guess in the right. far far future, we're going to have a different situation. Is this making the the Ring of Fire larger or smaller? Um. One of the things we're still trying to get a handle on is how is it that the plates rotate the way they do. Uh, we know that a new plate is basically going to come into existence. Um, plate may be too strong of a word. We know that a new continent is going to slowly grow into existence where Iceland is. Um, baby, tiny. Right. I mean, I growing. guess, you know, in Pangaea yeah. time, right, you had South America crunched into Africa. And so, yeah. there, you know, that whole area, is, and, that ocean is brand new, and right? And the Saudi Arabian Peninsula is breaking off of the Arabian plate off of, off of Africa. And, and so this is just all part of a, all the con continents are in constant motion. And there are predictions about what the different configurations would be. We know that there is a sea that's going to open up between Saudi Arabia and Africa. And it's just kind of amazing to think of Ethiopia becoming, uh, well, growing an ocean, kind of like the Mediterranean inside of it. But that's the future that we're looking at. Um, everything's in motion. And we just need to wait the billion years or so to see where it all goes. Right. So I think, you know, uh, based on this conversation, I will probably be killed by any manner of <laughs> terrible I, I would catastrophe. not say that. <clears throat> the, universe, uh, the universe is trying to kill me The universe is trying to kill you, but I think genetics and old yeah. age are much more of a fear. No, I, th I think if you're going to walk away with anything, it's colliding plates that are subducting like to breed volcanoes. They're pretty. Stay away from them. If you happen to live in that zone, know how to go up quickly. Yes. Um, and uh, if you want the Himalayas, um, just crash two plates in and let their ends fork up together. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. Okay, don't go anywhere. Ding. Saving. Um, we yeah. quitting Garage Band. I would love to go down and see the Costa Rica um, volcanoes. I've actually never seen. Like a like an erupting volcano. Like I've been to the we Big Island of Hawaii. That in and Hawaii in yeah, I know. I've never. Yeah, I haven't actually seen though it blobbing out lava. I'd love to see that. Okay. Exported. <laughs> Done. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Cool. And I'll start the upload. And my my daughter came in three times to ask me questions. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah, <laughs> I saw the look of kill child. We love your daughter, <laughs> but she like it's better this. You're you're only a year away from a teenager who doesn't want to speak to you. So enjoy it. Oh, that'll be sweet. I can't wait. Um, okay. All right, cool. And then, so yeah, so if you've got any questions, uh, I know we can't stick around too long, but we can take a few quick questions. Uh, one here, let's see. Uh, um, oh, Kevin Franklin says, how awesome is Pamela's microphone? Step up, Fraser Kane. I have <laughs> stepped up. I have an awesome microphone too. 
Yeah, that's the baby sibling to the one I've got. That's true. That's true. Your it, it's yours is a USB as well, right? No, mine. I I have a. a I have the icicle. Your, um, oh, you have an icicle and then plugged into USB. Yeah. This has got to just sound horrible now. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's not going to work now. All right. Um. Yeah. So. Uh. Yeah. No, I've got the uh, blue snowball, and it's a nice condenser mic that goes into the USB, and it is. Yeah. I'm so happy with it. Uh, his is know. just hidden underneath his yeah. his lower third. Yeah. But it's it's a pretty beefy condenser mic, so you just can't see it. It's just all. Built in. Yeah, I've I've been mine. I'm having geography, geometry issues, but that's a personal problem. Um, Icarus Factor notes that plate tectonics is a new field of science from the mid like 1900s. You would have thought it yeah. older than that. That's yeah. absolutely. I mean, uh, what 1950s was like the first yeah. you know proposals on plate tectonics, and there's a oh, there's a great story. I think Dawkins tells this story about how scientists will admit when they're wrong. And I think it was that one, that some preeminent scientist had, and I could be you know mushing this all up, but some preeminent scientist had been sort of against plate tectonics or a theory like that, and then when he presented with enough evidence, he just walked over, shook the hand of the scientist, and said, you know, you, you got me. You, you know, I yeah. was wrong. Yeah. You're right. I'm wrong. The it's, overwhelming it's evidence so has convinced, I know, has convinced me, and I, and I think you know we've talked about this a bit in some of the early episodes about um, the scientific method and things like that. Just how scientists, you know, ideally a scientist won't have any ego invested into their theory and their observations and so on. Right? Yeah, but we're humans, and so we still get our exactly, hurt. exactly. Yeah. But you know, ideally, you um, you just want to have. You want to have what's right, what's correct, make it out. And yeah. and if you're proven wrong, and <clears throat> but I mean, you know, the fact is, is that can you, can you imagine the journal? Is there a journal like this? The Journal of Negative Results? Oh, know? it's so there's different websites that different people in the open access community have been working to put together. But that that's actually a fundamental problem because it, it's one that actually I ran into with my dissertation because I discovered a perfectly good way to find radio cluster radio gal to find galaxy clusters using radio sources that required many times more work to gain like. 1%, 2% more chance of finding a galaxy cluster than just kind of pointing your tel pointing your telescope at any old radio source. Um, so that wasn't really publishable. It was a right. You did what? Yeah. <laughs> right. So you know, you know, something effective. We looked at a thousand clusters and we didn't find anything. Well, so so in in our case, it was a instead of looking at individual radio sources to see if they happened. You know that when you see a radio source on the sky, it's most likely going to be a galaxy. Most galaxies are in clusters. So when you look at a radio galaxy, you have a 20-something percent chance of finding a galaxy cluster around it. And so we got the neat idea that if you looked at a cluster of radio sources, you could increase the probability of finding a ga galaxy cluster. And no, what we were actually finding was lots of galaxies strung out at all different distances along the large scale structure. And it was just and, too hard to kind of tease out which was which. Well, no, you, we could tease out which was which just fine. That's what spectra are for. Um, but th the problem was when, when we looked, what we were hoping is all these objects that turned out to be line of sight would all be grouped together gravitationally, and they weren't. Um, yeah. And that's a non-interesting result. <laughs> uh, John Hrubesh says, can super Earth planets that are twice as large as Earth have plates, or would a planet that size have a thick crust like Mars? So so first, I think the super Earth planets that, that people are talking about, I mean, are, can they be twice as big as Earth? Um, it depends on, uh, I hate words like big and small. Uh, can they so have twice the radius of Earth? Um, you should be able to have twice the radius of Earth. It will have many times more mass than it. So depending on what the combination of density is based on what it's right. made of, what the metals are, things like that, how much volatile it's managed to capture. Um, yeah, there's no reason you couldn't have plate tectonics. It's just a matter of do they work like they do mm -hmm. on Earth. Don't know. It depends on mm -hmm. the thermodynamics of the system. Right. Um... 
tech there you can have plate tectonics on small things as well it's just they work differently yeah um, um, and you can end up with ice plate tectonics if you look at Europa yeah uh, Dex Luther asks we mentioned the 20 hour fundraiser if pe people don't have cash but they do have time is there something they can do uh, yeah just help get the word out Yes, yes. Also, uh, beyond helping to get the word out, um, tune into our Hangout-a-thon because we're going to be doing everything we can to teach you, and we're going to be working to engage you in things like coming up with a Cards Against Astronomy game. Uh, we're going to do some captioning contests. We're trying to build community as well. Uh, so you never know what warm body you're going to bring in is going to make bring bring the next great discovery to CosmoQuest. Uh, Michael Jobin suggests uh, sound effects for your hand gestures. <laughs> I need to have a theremin. Yeah. Play theremin. Just, and just, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Crazy sounds. Um, let's see. Okay, good. I think that's all the questions I've got. Uh, Kevin Franklin recommends the the Annals of Improbable Research, which is oh, that one's fantastic. Fun. Yeah. yeah. But that's more like just weird stuff that people, you know, yeah. researched as opposed to, you know, we researched this mundane thing and we got no result. Or we re researched this thing that we thought was going to be very exciting and it wasn't, and it wasn't which no. was my research. <laughs> right. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions we've got. So let's wrap it up because I know okay. you've got tons of uh, preparation to do and I have... Um, uh, children to have a conversation with about <laughs> daddy's recording astronomy cast <laughs> so um, cool alright well thank you very much Pamela thanks everyone for watching uh, so I guess the next big thing we're going to do the uh, the space hangout on Friday yes okay the weekly space hangout on mm -hmm. Friday yep. and then let the hangout a thon begin 9am pacific noon eastern I look forward to your on-air mental breakdown. For you science! Have no, I, you have no idea how many episodes we've recorded after I've pulled all-nighters programming. You don't I notice can, these things. I can tell. I can tell. No, no, I can tell. No. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thank you again, Pamela. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Okay. We will see you all uh, next time. Okay, bye-bye.